Okay, so we're going to start with the book of the House of Faith, which is the Cordal book, which is the Chat Gang's book, right? And we are just going from here. We're going to do a book a week, I think, we're going to try and go through, and we'll look at it, okay? Right, so we, first up, we're doing, so the Book of Faith is, is Cordor, so that's going to be, uh, they're, they're, like, they're effectively the peasant dudes, but they're, like, they're so lowly and gutter scummy, but they've got loads of faith in uh, robot Jesus, which is the emperor, yeah? So they've got loads of faith in him. Uh, yeah, they're zealots. Um, but you kind of come in two zealots. You've got the priests, zealots, and then you've got, like, the scum zealots. So, like, some of them are, like, in the ecclesiarchy, and then some of them are just, like, like they're like me, just povos. Yeah? They're just, like, big, uh, big povos. Uh, okay. Uh, have I checked out Sump City Radio? Uh, three ogres in a trench coat. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> no, I haven't. All right. So, we're going to start, but I might do. I will do in the future, so thank you. Okay, so we're going to do exotic beasts. And the first one we're going to look at are sheen birds, which are something you can actually buy. We did earlier on discover that you can't actually buy some miniatures that are currently in these books, which is nuts. So the Sheen Birds are four robotic eagles that cost a lot of cash. Uh, I can see how the game really sucks you in because I can be a year, uh, I can be a year in and a thousand pounds down before really feeling obliged to understand how this works. Yeah. Um, thank you, three ogres in trench coat. I'll try to join in a bit. Right. Okay. So Sheen Birds. Ancient biomechanical constructs created long ago to evoke an illusory sense of the long-lost splendor of the natural world. Sheen birds were once wonders, combining the finest mechanical constructions of the cult cybernetica with the most elegant clone craft of the cult biologists. They were processed. Uh, they were possessed of rudimentary programming, causing them to mimic real birds flocking together, roosting, feeding, even nesting. But of course, AI is banned in Warhammer 40k. Obviously, not in real life. Um, as I now am just literally a human chat GPT bot. Uh, over the millennia, sheen birds' numbers have gradually dwindled, though, sad. Lack of preservation, classic, with the surviving examples becoming corrupted beyond recognition. Their flesh is diseased and their plumage is scarce. The remaining sheen birds are foul things, infested with parasites and filthy with pollution. Even their rudimentary programming is corrupted, causing them to act as sinister parodies of real birds. Generally, Real birds are chill, but I think a lot of Australians would be like, no, I actually get attacked a lot by birds, right? They do. So, like, you know, they always get them bin chickens chasing them down. But generally, normal birds are fine, right? Yeah, magpies, right? Okay. Occasionally, sheep birds will make their way into the lower levels of the underhive. Here, they're greeted with the awe by the devoted of House Cordor, obviously because they're povos and they see a bit of meat and they love it. Who view them as avatars of the Emperor's grace? Why why are the Cordor guys such creeps? For high-ranking Cordor gangers, to possess a sheen bird is akin to possessing the direct blessing of the Emperor himself. Ooh. Okay. Interesting. So, like, so you kind of want some sheen birds. Because you kind of want to be like, well, it depends how fanatical you're making your gang. If you're making your gang pretty fanatical, you're like, yeah, yeah like sheen birds all day but if you're kind of like just povos and not too bothered about the emperor maybe skip the sheen birds i think is fine and sheen birds are only takeable in in cordor right okay so they're only takeable taken in cordor cordor sheen birds so you can't take them in other gangs um the bird the bourgeoisie <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's really good the bourgeoisie is excellent thank you i might even can i i'm gonna write i'm gonna steal that i'm gonna that's so funny <laughs> the bourgeoisie is great all right so bourgeoisie okay <laughs> the bourgeoisie. <laughs> all right okay uh and then uh then we find out about all their stuff uh they've got flight bait we could get into the rules for them later Rake away at the end of the Sheen Bird's activation. If the owner is standing and active or prone and pinned, they may choose to make a willpower check. If this check is passed, the Sheen Bird will immediately make a free move. Uh, skill access should a Sheen Bird become specialist is access to the following set of skills. Okay. All right. Okay. Sheen Birds. Sheen Birds are in there. How are we feeling about Sheen Birds? They put up warnings about the magpies. We also accept that as a normal thing. If you're not making uh, your gang fanatical, why are you running Cordor though? Yeah, but you might... Oh, no. It's not Cordor. 
that's a great joke there, Pershaw. That is excellent. Um, I don't know if I'd put these in here, because for 24 quid, three burbs isn't really doing it for me. Is that fair? Like, I don't think I... If I'm going to spend 24 quid on miniatures, it's probably not going to be on three birds, which I could get for anything else. Right? But I guess you could be like a bird dude. Um, how many exotic beasts are you allowed in a gang? Um, needs more Bob. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It's just a bit like... Pfft, it's fine. All right. Okay, sheen birds. Sheen birds done. Uh, might not want to go too fanatical. The popo will outlaw you. Exactly. There must be a proxy robot you could print. Yeah, how much are those? Eight pounds each. That's correct. Eight pounds each. You're on the Forge World site, so I'm not sure you're expecting RE price. Like, I know it's going to be expensive. My point is, like, 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 especially for a game that feels very, like, kit bashable, it feels like you can do any birds as sheen birds. Like, any bird is fine as a sheen bird, in my opinion. Um... You could use literally any birds. So I think that's fine. Right, next one is a little bit less likely uh, to find as a 3D print, which is uh, a weird mechanical angel. Um, the Cherub Servitor is an exotic beast. I don't think it's purchasable. So let me just check. Uh, not on its own anyway. So no, I don't think you can get a Cherub Servitor um, as something you can buy on its own. I think you would have to... Uh, uh, no mini, I think, but could use one of them from the Sisters of Battle. But they're available in the Sisters of Battle kit. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, this this is only usable in Cordor? Okay. Uh, hello, Focus Twitch Streams. Uh, the Order's Militant and Freitas Militia are often accompanied by... Uh, oh, wait, no. Created by the Magi Biologists, Cherub Servitors are a common sight on Imperial Worlds. Particularly so amongst the many branches of the Imperial Creed. Their use varies depending upon need, with many serving a purely decorative or ritual purpose. Bearing censers or holy icons during the endless sermons of the Ecclesiarchy, others carry small items for those uh, they serve or, in some cases, operate machinery high in the domes and rafters of shrines and cathedrals. Right? Uh, they can have, you can have a cherub in the gang? The naked baby robots? Yes, you can. All ox shouldn't be dead, uh, wouldn't be seen dead with a naked flying baby in their gang. That's true. Um, uh, like, uh, yeah, so this is interesting. The Orders Militant and Fraturus Militia are often accompanied by war cherub servitors. They fulfill a number of roles from porting ammunition of war gear to acting as a form of... I reckon a baby can't carry a lot of ammo. So of all the things to make carry ammo a baby isn't the best thing you would want you would want like a big dude i can't imagine why a priest would have a cherub servitor but i think it was involved the inquisition <laughs> no that was their job in the old devastate kit too yeah it's okay it's a dead baby it's a robot baby mate i'm just saying it well if you're going to make a robot anything make it a big robot Right? That's what I'm saying. Anyway, it's funny to see them try. Maybe that's why they're there. Maybe they're there just for comic relief. You're in the grim dark of the far future. You're up against another unimaginable nightmare. You've loaded your gun. And you're like, I need a I need a new bullet. And then you turn around and there's just like a baby trying to carry like a like a like a big bullet. And that's pretty funny. Like you're like, that's oh, that's the comic relief I needed today. Like, you just kind of, like, lock and load. Like, oh, never mind. <laughs> this is fine. <laughs> uh, maybe it's because people are reluctant to shoot babies. That's what I've thought about Chaos Warriors. I've thought they'll they'll murder and destroy whole planets, but they'll they'll really worry about um, uh, <laughs> shooting a baby. <laughs> if it's any bigger, it wouldn't be able to fly. It's like that. Okay. All right. Um, from porting ammunition and war gear to acting as a form of mobile cover. It's not uncommon to see well-funded redemptionists similarly accompanied by cherub servitors. How these criminal rabble-rousers came into possession of such companions is something of a mystery, suggesting links to noble houses and even sects of the ecclesiarchy itself. Okay, so you can't currently buy this mini, the cherub servitor, but you can take it in... Uh, you can take it in a Cordor gang, so that's gang-specific. 
So if you're running if you're running Cordor, then you can run the Cherub Servitor, uh, the Comic Relief uh, of the gang. I'm worried your burbs might take the shiny ammo from the dead babies. <laughs> This is why I'm into this game. Yes, Scrimo. This is why I'm into this universe. Because it is just weird as fuck. Right? Uh, is it all Cordor or only Redemptionists get the Cherubs? Ooh, great question. Uh, oh, no. I don't know. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. A Cherub Servitor ignores all terrain. Bodyguard, if a Cherub Servitor's owner is hit by a ranged attack, the controlling player may choose to transfer the hit and its effects into the Cherub Servitor within two inches of the owner. What are we playing? What are we playing? You're there and you're like about to get shot and then you sacrifice the baby. Oh my god. Bullet shielded baby. <laughs> Oh, dead baby go! <laughs> oh my god! This is a nightmare fuel. Okay, this is what I thought would be fun. Now we're actually into it. This is so fun. Alright. Okay, so this is... Uh, can you get rat cherubs? What, like baby rats? I don't know. Uh, this feels like the logical endpoint of the early 2000s dead baby joke period. Agreed, little bit of level. Uh... It's not like you're killing the baby again. That's true. You could use these for your uh, for your robot ammo babies, says Squeezel. The Retributor Squad. Yeah, so there they are. So there are the the robot dead babies on the left and on the right. But you would have to buy the whole kit. I reckon that there's a lot of people who build... Like, because, like, there's a lot of Normans that play Warhammer now. Like, a lot of Normans. And if Normans are going to play anything, they play 40k, right? And then if they're going to do anything, they might collect Sisters of Battle because they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I can get into this. It's just nuns. But I reckon they get to the stage where they get to the dead babies and they aren't sure and then they sell them online. I reckon, what's a Norman? Just like a normal person. Uh, they're also in the base sister squad. There shouldn't be cherubs around. The baby with the eye augmented looks like <laughs> like looks like Hasbulla. <laughs> it does look like Hasbulla. <laughs> I fucking love Hasbulla. I don't want to see Hasbulla play 40k loads. Um, the robot program is running on the dead baby's brain, so you, you're kind of killing them again. <laughs> this is a lot. <laughs> it's a fucking. Can we get a close up of Hasbulla? Where is he? Hasbulla. There he is. <laughs> you know, that dude is 20 years old. Yeah, I do. I do. All right. Okay. Um, okay, so this is fine. All right, next up, Clovis. Now, you can buy Clovis. We're finally in it. Okay, this is Clovis. Uh... Uh, you would watch to see Hasbro get uh, punted out the window in the swimming pool, though. <laughs> no, Gavati, thank you so much for resubscribing. Um, Hasbro is a giga chad. He is. Clovis is hot. Okay. Clovis is hot. He's got a, f a head. His head is literally on fire. He has a chain sword and he's reading a book. Right? Clovis. We're all about Clovis. And then he's also got. He's with Deacon Malakev. And I'm really hoping both these two miniatures, A, can be taken together and in the same book. Uh, the red-brown boxes are law. The character profile should be below. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I quite, like, I'm quite happy to go through this as a slow roll if everyone else in the chat is. Because I want to know who these people are. Like, versus, like, just what they do and stuff. I, like, I want to get to know the universe first. I haven't, I don't know the universe enough yet. So, Clovis had a comic book, if you haven't seen it? No. Right, the Cherubs have rules for sisters. Don't they give plus to hit or something for at least a heavy weapon squad? Oh, they might do, actually. Uh, Dean Manamapa Peppa. -pa. That's true. Mm. The Redeemer is a legend among the people of Necromunda. A furious firebrand and fanatical warrior whose devotion to the redemption is unmatched by its peers. Um... 
Have you read any of the Black Library Necromunda novels? Not yet. Uh, I've got them on audiobook. Yeah, go through their blurb, else they're just expensive minis. I agree. Clovis has a theme song too? Oh, no. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you fire. Do do do! Do do do! <laughs> do, do, do. Oh, it's probably that's probably demonetized our video, but fuck it, who cares? <laughs> be, do, be, and a fire. Be, be, be. That would be so great to play while you're playing that one. Anyway, um, uh, once he was a noble of Clan Cordor, known as Lord Clovis. Okay, and enjoyed the wealth of the clan's upper classes in High Primus. Uh, some even say he could have taken up the mantle of Thane, should he have wanted it, but instead chose a different path, casting off the trappings of nobility. The Redeemer set out into the Underhive to purge the unclean and spread the word of the redemption. It was not long before he had drawn a band of zealous followers, fighters drawn from the strength of his convictions and the brutal methods he favoured, Deacon Malakiv, a diminutive servo scribe, is perhaps the most well-known of these. A devoted member of the faith turned into a servitor. He followed the Redeemer on his crusades diligently, recording his great deeds, as well as carrying the Liber Excruciatus, Clovis's infamous book of tortures. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Okay. It does get real dark real quick, this game. I forget about this all the time. Okay. So that's Clovis. I, I'm really interested in the Servitor, bro. Okay. So, Servitors are, like, post-human, right? They're, like, transhuman. I think that's the right way of describing them. Like, I assume a Servitor has, like, its own thoughts and feelings still. Uh, server bro is ace. Yeah. Team, I should probably start packing. I'll fly to LVO in 20 hours. Nurgle Matthew, say hello to Val for me. I'm making some videos for Val later. Please say hello to him from me. If you can get a photo with Val, please just do that for me. I would love to see you two together. Probably goes without saying, I need to finish painting my army first. That's fair. They're lobotomized. Really? Lot no servitors are mind wiped and reprogrammed. So, so then it's... Okay. It's lobotomized humans. Some rarely still have some very base thoughts and feelings. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's very dark. So wait, so this guy was like his bud. Wait, it was not long before he had drawn uh, strength of his convictions. Um, Deacon Malakitiv, a diminutive servo scribe, is perhaps the most well-known of these. A devoted member of the faith turned into a servitor. Oh, so he's just a dude who was like, yeah, I'm super into this. Uh, thank you, Nogal Matthew, for donating the gift sub. Lobotomized vending machines are future ideas for Elon and Bezos. Let's not talk about it. Ha we've got lots of humans. There's actually a really really dark video like i don't want to bring up the dark lord himself yeah but if i say he's an agent of chaos <laughs> but the the idiotic <laughs> the idiotic agent of chaos the dragon of chaos will murder us all uh has suggested um uh if you know who i'm talking about uh, john p peterson uh, that fucking idiot, uh, in uh, one of his videos, suggested that the that there were 10% of human beings that were incapable of producing anything of value, but also they were, while worthless to society and unable to produce, this is all bullshit that he made up, by the way, completely unprovable. Um, uh, like, there's, like, because he has this argument where every, like, where there are problems, but nothing can be done. He's, like, the literal worst person. Like, he walks in, he's like, there's a flood. Everything's flooding. And nothing can be done! And you're like, well, we fix the plumbing, you know, divert the water. There's a load of things that can be done. Uh, right, he is such a twat. I agree. And we all agree. And if you're in the comments being like, I don't think he's a twat, you're a twat. Go watch some more news is a uh, review of John Pearson. If you want, that'll help you out. Uh, thank you to focus Twitch streams for donating five gift subscriptions specifically because he hates John Pearson. That's the, that's the energy I want in the chat. Um, uh, anyway. So my point is, is he makes the, makes the, he makes the inference, which is not true. Um, that 10% of human population is worthless and can't uh, produce or do anything useful. 
Uh, and then, like, the right-wing commentator he's talking to says something along the lines of, well, they could be used to help robots. And I was like, that's so fucking 40K, right? Um, like, like, insane. Imagine a sick as fuck eating only beef and still pretending you're smart. Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, that 10% of his fans, maybe. Correct. Yeah, the 10% of the useless society are his fans. But when I read this and I read about lobotomized human beings, I'm like, oh, no. Um, if I had to do a fucking annoying deep dive because I had a student who was a fan so I could debunk it and get him to move on from Peterson. It's so tough. There's a great video. This is this is not very necessary, but like I'll show you very quickly. My favorite video on this subject, if you're interested, uh, is uh, by this guy. So this is this is Mr. Some More News. Uh, so uh, the news guy, uh, Cody Shoney, uh, and he has this video, a brief look at Jordan Peterson, which is three and a half hours long. Uh, so if you'd like to do something that is entertaining, that's a super valuable watch. Um, such a John Pearson, yes, correct, Douglas. Um, uh, Crit viewer agreed. He's not even a good young Ian. He's not even a good young Ian. Thank you, Leah Crusher. Uh, and that's some nonsense in general. Yes, <laughs> Wombo. <laughs> I mean, I would absolutely love to do something with someone who's, but they're legit massive YouTubers, and I'm just an idiot who does like Warhammer content. Like, absolutely huge fans. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Right, so you can buy Clovis, right? And then we've talked about... I mean, I really shouldn't put this inside the YouTube video. This is not YouTube thug stuff, but whatever. Uh, a lifetime of bringing the righteous redemption to the outcasts and heretics of Necromunda has hardened the Redeemer against such petty notions as pity or mercy. And those who face him know they can expect no quarter from the zealous warrior. To further terrify his foes, the Redeemer wears a flaming crown upon his head. He's blazing fire, spitting and sparking as his furious gaze burns into his enemies. Wait, okay. Uh, uh, professors love individual freedom. It's system so humanity useless only for parts. Agreed. Uh, leave it uh, in and we'll start YouTube comments war. All right, perfect. I'll leave it in. Um, like, we, we need to throw more of that into the Thursday show because there are some chuds on the Thursday. Like... Uh, YouTube comments, but different convo. Uh, right, okay. So Clovis, if we go back to Clovis for a second, his head is on fire, right? And this is the thing we need to talk about. Like, so his head is legitimately on fire, and we need to talk about that. So what does it say in the book? To further terrify his foes, the Redeemer wears a flaming crown upon his head. His blazing fire, spitting and sparking, his furious gaze burns into his enemies. His former wealth as a noble and his connection to Upper Circle's House Cordor afford him weapons and war gear of exceptional quality. His crimson robes hide quilted mesh armor, able to stop auto rounds and las blasts, while, his, while he favors a well-maintained chain weapons like his custom eviscerator, known as the Sword of Persecution. Rumour has it that he has an even built a fortress somewhere out in the Ash Wastes and is his own armoured transport that he uses to purge the wilds of mutants, monsters and other heretics. Like, ignoring, like, the religious vibes. Like, sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. I love how much character they have, like, in 40 years, like, he's a space marine captain. But in this, it's like, you've got this whole universe. It feels very alive. Uh, this is 40k turned up to 11. Oostogen classic. Let's go. Uh, that narrative confers redemptionists are <laughs> leftists, right wingers will have nothing to do with Furious Case. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> the greatest strength of a redeemer, however, is not his considerable skills as a warrior or the unique weapon he carries, but rather the strength of his faith. In many ways, he's the embodiment of redemption, a pure expression of religious fury. Followers from the redemption fight harder under his gaze, just as is the enemies of the faith quail in fear. A terror only reinforced. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, well, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, as a redeemer himself likes to say, if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't count. Oofed. So he's, uh, yeah, if you ignore the religious fiber cord, what's left, Rob? What is left? <laughs> I'm not saying to ignore it. <laughs> They have used... Like, this is literally the blurb for every 40k character as well, but sure. Okay. And do we get a blurb about the actual guy? 
A house court or gang does not simply hire the redeemer. Instead, he may agree to aid a gang when a petition is made by a gang leader. If a gang wishes to hire the redeemer, the controlling player must roll on the following table during the appropriate step of the pre-battle sequence. Oh my god. Note that a house court or gang may make a petition to hire the redeemer or it may roll on the house favours table. It may not do both. Um... Uh, but it will cost them. Your gang may hire this battle for 200 credits. Okay. So you can just hire him for 200 credits. We don't have to roll on a table. 200 credits. We get Clovis the Redeemer. Okay. So pretty expensive if you wanted to take it. But then what about his bro? Is his bro free? Deacon Malikev. Okay. Hold on. We'll read through this in a minute. This is for Campaign Not Skirmish. But yeah, now we know he's 200 credits. Right, that's how we worked out. Because here it says star credits, but now we know he's 200 credits. Right? Clovis the buttery. <laughs> Shut up, Terry. Shut up. Right. If an enemy fighter wishes to make a fight, basic or shoot basic action that targets his fighter, they must make a willpower check. The Redeemer generates faith dice as normal, uh, and he's also an outlaw. Uh, oh, wait. The Redeemer is an outlaw hired gun. Does that mean he's generic? Question mark. 200 or fire like is he just tuned in is this guy a clown uh what the the redeemer no he's a murder bot this guy literally murders as many people as he can and sets stuff on fire this is what he is um what wait this is ridiculous so wait if he's a bounty hunter no not a bounty hunter sorry a hired gun am i allowed to just take him in any gang uh last sentence the Redeemer feels the gang's capable of fighting his own battles. The gang may not hire him for this battle. Note that House Corner Gang may make a petition to hire the Redeemer. Or uh, only House Corner Gangs. Yes. Wait, but no. Only House Corner Gangs can petition. Okay, whatever. Well, let's just let's just, let's just just say. Let's just say. Uh, if he's getting hired out to all these places, and he risks he'll give himself spread thin. Because <laughs> he's clothing. Shut up, Leo. Shut up. Okay. All right. House corner only. Okay, he's in. So Clovis, the Redeemer, and Malikev. All right. That's good news because I was worried. Okay. Um, right, let's put him on a little document. Right. Corridor only. Uh, Clovis. But what about Dean Malikev? What does it say about this guy? Uh, bodyguard, if the Redeemer is hit with a ranged attack, the controller... Oh, my God. Why are they so mean to all their little dudes? Literally everyone is just like a bullet sponge. Uh, dedicated servant and follows the Redeemer. When a gang hires a Redeemer, he is accompanied by Deacon Malakev. Deacon Malakev cannot be hired on his own during deployment step. Nice. And it doesn't cost any points for Dean Malakev. So he's just free. So he's... It's 200 points for both. Uh, Dean Malakev, 200 points for both. Uh, services aren't people anymore, Rob. They don't count. This really, really fucks with a lot of my feelings. <laughs> Wait, can I see what he does? Dedicated follower. We've done that. Deacon Malakiv records the great deeds of the Redeemer's Crusade through the Underhive. Part of his record lists the names of the faithful that fought alongside his master. If Deacon Malakiv is on the battlefield and not seriously injured during the war wrap-up, the gang uh, gets D3 reputation. Unfortunately, we're not doing campaign. Um... He has an infamous book of tortures, the Liber Excruciatus. All right. Here's Boromir for the deacon. Exactly. A screen. <laughs> uh, over the years, it's become grown, uh, it has grown through the amendment and addition to become a mighty tome. Whilst the Redeemer is within one inch of Deacon Malakiv, and if both fighters are standing and active, the Redeemer may perform Know Your Fate basic action. Ooh. The Redeemer fixes his gaze upon his enemies and reads aloud from the Liber Excruciatus informing them of the tortures they can expect. D3 enemy fighters, chosen by the Redeemer, are that within 9 inches of the Redeemer and could draw a line to the Redeemer must immediately make a nerve test and minus one modifier. <gasps> That's pretty badass. A special, special points if you turn up to the event with the Redeemer, with the book open, right? And then you start reading. You're like, the tortures you can expect are... And start... Um, Interesting. That's pretty cool. I like that. All right. Okay, fun. 
Okay, so cool. They're, like that's a uh, two hundred points to add that to your gang's pretty rad. Roll on the torture table. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> this is Necromunda Gotrek and Felix. Uh yeah. Um okay, so now we've got hangers on and brutes. Uh hangers on. Each of the different types of hangers on brings a specific benefit or special rule to the gang that employs them. Hangers on do not normally take part in battles. So you do you don't take hangers on in a game. Like you don't put them in your like squad that go out and battle. Okay, that's fine. And then you've got Brutes. Unlike other hangers-on, Brutes are purchased with the express intention that they be fueled in battle and are treated like any other fighter when selecting a crew. Uh, hangers-on usually give you a buff. Interesting. No, they're buffing you pre-battle. Okay, so you may, but you might purchase the hanger-on. Interesting. Hangers-on cannot gain experience or advantages. Okay. Uh, they take part in some scenarios. Ooh, okay. All right, so hangers-on might go in your gang. Um... All right, brutes. Okay, so then what have we got? Hangers on that are available. A hive preacher. Okay, so no model for a hive preacher. Headsman, Rattus, and a Cordor Stig Shambler. But no. So these are just characters that you would like kit bash, right? You would kit bash a hanger on. Uh, sorry, you would kit bash a hive preacher as a hanger on. You wouldn't. Unlike other hangers-on, this fighter is always ready to fight, as long as the fighter is part of the gang roster. They are treated just like a regular ganger for the purpose of selecting a crew. Therefore, this might have maybe chosen to randomly select as part of their gang starting crew, just like any other ganger. Oh, so you can put this guy in your squad. Um, uh, aren't they just aren't they in the plastic box? That's a great question. Okay, Hive Preacher chat is going in. So you can have a Hive Preacher who's 90 points. 90 points. Uh, a flagellant with a las pistol. Interesting. Um, Underhive settlements are filled with hivers claiming to be preachers and priests of the Imperial Creed and the redemption is no different. A Cordor gang might attract one of these maniacal dome preachers, blessing them before battle or simply wandering around their hideout, spouting religious dogma and getting everyone riled up. Interesting. Okay. A gang with a high preacher may roll a d6 at the end of pre-battle sequence. We don't care about that. Uh, they can fight in a battle. Uh, a high preacher can only be hired by outlaw gangs. Okay, fine. Okay, so a high preacher. Uh, Blackstone Fortress Preacher is a good proxy. Love that. Love that. Have you got a link? I want to look at it. Uh, the Flagellator. Available to House Cordor only. So these are all available to House Cordor only. So, and again, this doesn't have a model. Purification through pain is a common belief in the redemption, and gangs sometimes employ specialist flagellators to motivate and heal their members. Uh-oh. A wounded ganger or one suffering from underhive malady may well forget the injuries and be back in the fight if staying in the gang's hideout means regular whippings. Uh, don't threat me with a good time. This is great. This is great. Uh, Dad Bod, thank you. Let's just... Oh, yeah, he would be great. That's great. What from Blackstone Fortress? Taddeus the Purifier. Uh, my gang is quite difficult to find. Would that mean the only one who could ever reach me was the son of a high preacher, man? <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> the son of a preacher, man. Okay. So during the pre-battle sequence, after setting up the battlefield... Uh, the chosen fight immediately makes a toughness check if this passed. So you would probably wouldn't take this guy because this feels like. But you could maybe he's thirty credits a flagellator, but he's a hanger on. So you probably am not going to take a flagellator because he's thirty points. So he's like a healer. So I don't think you'll take a flagellator. Um. Okay. Rogue docks. Available to any gang. All right. Okay. So if a gang is a rogue doc, you can make an additional medical escort action in the post-battle sequence in addition to any other post-battle actions. However, they're over six, blah, blah, blah. If a gang has more than one rogue doc, a rogue doc may be armed with... So you can't do anything with a rogue doc in the game. So the docs... Uh, like, the, the doc is campaign only, right? Rogue docs are campaign only, surely. Uh, oh, there's a fire preacher proxy. Oh, nice.
Nice. A missionary zealot. I think that's from the... Uh, isn't that from the actual... Uh, that's just from the corridor box, right? Because there's the fire preacher box. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, but that's awesome. If it max out hangers on, how low can we go on our model count? Pretty low, I think. Um, but I don't think you can... I don't think you can have a rogue dock. And you also don't want... Like, you want a lot of models because otherwise you have to start taking, like, checks and stuff. So I'm going to go for... Another benefit not playing campaigns, less doxing. Exactly. Right. No rogue docs for us. A gang lookout, available to any gang. Uh, if a gang with a gang lookout is a defendant in a scenario that uses sneak attack rules, I'd want to roll so many if essentially spots an attacker. Interesting. But again, a gang lookout is available to any gang. And that's a hanger on. So available to uh, not brutes, gangers, not guilds. Uh, I'm just going to put hangers on. Uh, and then that's gang lookout and gang docks. Gang docks. You could use this uh, in a one-off. You could use this in a one-off. You think you could use gang a gang lookout in a one-off if the scenario fit it? Uh, this is the new Necromunda birdie DJ. Uh, it's, it was in the old Necromunda. Like, well, I mean, it's all Necromunda. Um, it's not... It's Since Games Workshop released it. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, you could use this in a one-off. Okay. Generic and add to any gang. This is gang lookout, but that's a hanger on, right? Hanger on. Okay. Obviously, obviously just get that right. Okay, good. Uh, what's next? A dome runner. Ooh. Uh, a gang's turf is its primary source of income, but it expands outwards. The gangers might find themselves in areas they've never even visited. Local guides refer to as dome runners, a regular site among gangs, which throughout its new turf's hidden treasures. House Corridor uh, use runners to scout out potential missions for redemption to find lost artifacts. Whenever a fighter from a gang with a dome runner opens a loot casket, they may choose to reroll D6 to determine what contents are. However, they must accept the result of the reroll, even if it's worse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're expecting people to sneak, etc. Okay, perfect. Uh, do we need a dome runner in a one shot, like in a in a squad, like in a in our like regular format? Because that sounds like you would, right? Objective play could save you from being blown up. All right, Dome Runner, let's go. Dome Runner, 20 creds. This is cool as well, because this is a bunch of stuff that you defo can kit bash, which is quite cool. Love, love this. Okay, uh, Hanger On, Gang Lookout, Dome Runner. Nice. Okay. Ammo Jacks. Yes, like my guy. I painted an Ammo Jack. Let's go, Ammo Jack. Um, there is a mini for a dome runner on Forge World. Hold on. Let's go find out if that's true. Uh, no, not that. Box games. No, no. All Necromunda. A dome runner. Let's find a dome. Let's find the dome runner. Click hired guns. Uh, okay. One second, one second. Um, let's find them all. So hired guns is just the generic one, right? So anything that's... Uh, let me get this right. Hired gun is literally anything... Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can only take this guy in in Brutes. Do, get me a dome runner. Uh, oh, a, look, they do a rogue dock and a gang lookout miniature. Oh, awesome. Yeah, but I don't know if that guy would be your gang lookout because he's like a bit generic. Um... Like, like I would say, like the rogue dock, it makes sense because that's a skill set. Anyone can be a rogue dock, yeah. But the if you were going to do a gang lookout, you would at least make them look like your gang. This guy's way too professional to be a gang lookout, in my personal opinion. Uh, I think the rogue dock you wouldn't kit bash, but I would think you would kit bash the gang lookout personally. Um, I'd spend dosh on these. Interesting. Uh, okay, hold on. I mean, what's fun is, is like, if you did hire, like, it, let's say you were doing the popo, right? You can always just say that this Scrutinar Privates miniature was a gang lookout. Like, that's what's fun, right? It's just anyone with eyeballs can be a gang lookout. Um, I'm trying to find the Dome Runner. Ammo Jack and Dome Runner. Oh, nice. 
okay, this is pretty cool. So that's your dome runner that you would bring along. And then that's your, that's your ammo jack. <laughs> uh, like, that's, they're fun. So that makes a load of sense. And do you use them in, do you use them in game? I don't think you use them in game. They have stats though, right? The ammo jack has a stat. The actual, yeah, the dome runner is 20 credits and has a stack. Um, and the gang lookout also has, a, like, stats. So I think that they probably play in the game. They're not just, like, they're, like, miniatures you use, like, ammo jacks help you reload. So, like, you actually br bring them into the game, right? I would bring a gang lookout into the game. I'd bring a dome runner into the game as I was playing. They're not just, like, miniatures that are on the side, right? Like... Bribing the popo to look out for you, all ox thoughts. <laughs> that's true. But what I'm saying is you're bringing them into the game, right? And that's fun. So that would mean, though, like, if you bought, let's say, the Rogue Dock and Gang Lookout as miniatures and painted them, then you, if, you, if you're playing Cordor one day and then you're playing Goliath the other day, then the, you're always, these miniatures are always going to be usable between both gangs. So there's a bit of a saving there if you're someone who flips between the different gangs. Which is pretty fun. I mean, you could kitbash them, obviously, but like, this is quite nice. Like, if that ends up being the case, that's qu that's quite cool. So you could just be like, cool, I'm going to buy those. Um, uh, they're like a five wound utility piece for AOS. Yeah, sure. That ammo jack have bolters, and uh, they are nasty. Nice. Um, all right. I love this. Is okay. I'm really getting this now. This is so fun. All right. Uh, ammo jacks. You can have zero to three. Uh, as gangs become more experienced, they discover the importance of regular weapon checks. Running out of ammunition or suffering a gun jam in the middle of a firefight is not acceptable for a gang that wishes to be taken seriously. House Cordor have a reputation of poor quality of their firearms and other weapons. Um, if a gang has an ammo jack, its weapons are regularly serviced and their ammo stocks are carefully maintained. As such, fighters from a gang can re-roll any failed ammo checks that are a natural roll of one. The ammo jack does not have to take part in the battle for the gang to receive this bonus. But if they are not available for the battle, for example, they're in recovery, the bonus does not apply. But so you, but you can put them in the battle. And they're 50 credits. So it's 50 credits. So like, if I wanted to, getting this right, I could just take three ammo jacks. Uh, good morning, Drew Barry. I could just have three ammo jacks in my army with their stat line that we can see now. Move five. Weapon skill 4, ballistic skill 3. So I could just load up on ammo jacks. Right? I'm pretty certain. Uh, like, that would be cool if you could do that. Okay, fun. So, submissions, you have random selection from your gang. The others come in from reserves. Submissions, you have random selection from your gang. So the others come in from reserves. But you could definitely have these guys in your gang, right? And then they play. Um, Rerolled the shit out of your ammo checks with three jacks. Exactly. Right? Uh, Ballistic Seal 3 Plus, are they good as well? Nice. Okay, this is fun. 0 to 3 ammo jacks. Fuck yeah. Okay, and then they've got. What gun have they got? Uh, does it say? Uh, no, they're not intended for use in skirmish play. They're explicitly balanced around not turning up in battles. Oh, really? Uh. Like, yep, you can. They're not intended for use in skirmish play. They're explicitly balanced around not turning up in battles. Isn't the game wildly not balanced, though? Like, terribly, terribly unbalanced. That's what I'm asking. Um, uh, okay, Slopper. Chat. This is the future. Slopper. No. Hold on. Where's Slopper? Come on, Slopper. Don't let me down. Let's go, Slopper. Where are you? Come on. Slopper and Scabber. <laughs> Slopper. <laughs> okay. We need to know if we can take Slopper. Uh, Ammo Jacks have a bolter, which is terrifying. Okay. So, like, the idea that you would bring that into the game is actually quite scary for 50 credits. Is that what we're saying? Uh, I still want that model hangers on with some gang specific stuff. I agree with you. The game has shit balance and leads on players not being dickhead sense to the arbiter role. Um, uh, says Dad Bod, that's fair. Slopper following the Nurgle naming scheme. Exactly. All right, so let's read about Slopper, shall we? Um, food in the Underhive rarely holds any joy. Most meals consist of corpse starch, nice, or Nutri-Slime, 
supplemented with synth fats and vitamin shots. As such, anyone who can produce real food from the local flora and fauna can expect a steady stream of credits. Clan Cordor sloppers are well known for their countless ways they can prepare an underhive rat. What? We eat rats? Oh my god. Grubs up. At the end of the spend experience phase or pre-battle sequence, roll a d6 for each of the gang's fighters that's in recovery. Roll of six constant supply of good food to help them recover more quickly. A slopper is armed with a fighting knife. A slopper has no skills. Uh, you would not bring this in a one-off. Okay. So, you would not bring this in a one-off. A slopper. Okay. Uh, so, this is... Uh, do not bring in a one-off. Okay, that's sad. Uh, this is super sad. In my opinion, that you can't bring slopper. Because he's the one I want to bring the most. <laughs> he looks fantastic. Okay, brutes. Cordor Stig Shambler. Okay. All right. So, Cordor Stig Shambler is now... Look at this. So, this is a special dude who is absolutely the business. So, he looks like a, an ogre or an ogrin or something being ridden by another guy with a giant gun or a flamer. Hello, Phil Springers. Uh, I like the rattling slopper. So, the scenario rules individually sp specify who you take. Okay, idiot win. Thank you. Often this will be random. So who you take in your scenario will be random. What? Okay, that sounds silly. Okay, Brutes. The Stig Shambler. Okay, so now we know what the Stig Shambler looks like. So it looks like this. Okay, and he's pretty hot in my opinion. Master Blaster. Right? That's what we're looking at. The preachers and rabble rousers of the Defout House Cordor have little tolerance for the mutant and the abhuman. Such deformities of the body are clear evidence, so the leaders tell them of the corruption that lurks within the soul. How can anyone who lives with a life in loyalty to the Emperor, anyone who dedicates their every action to his glory, their every moment of toil and betterment of this Imperium, ever become so corrupt and debased form? Oh, wow. Physical abnormalities are clear evidence, then, that those afflicted have turned their gaze away from this light and shunned him as one of their true master. And so the devout of House Cordor will hunt them down and exterminate such affronts to him on terror with great prejudice wherever they attempt to hide from his light. Um, some scenarios have you stare at starting within a few inches of the enemy in a line in the middle of the board. <laughs> Just don't play those scenarios, though. That seems like the easiest answer. <laughs> and yet, expectations not only exist within the teaming ranks... Uh, oh, wait, hold on. Uh... Physical abnormality is a clear evidence that they've they've turned away from the 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 high lord, right? And yeah, expectations not only exist within the team ranks of House Cordor, but could even be called common. Interesting. Many denizens of Cordor are lame of body or weak of wit. Many are abnormally large or strangely proportioned and peculiar to behold. How it is that such variation from the accepted baseline norm of humanity can be tolerated within a house that claims to despise such variations is something of a mystery. But to the Cordor themselves, the answer is simply one of faith. If their leaders choose to allow these souls to live, then live they will, just like any other Cordor, dedicating their lives to the holy cause. Ooh. Um, Master Buster, Games Workshop must protect their original IP. How did they... They're such geniuses at their original IP. I would, I would argue, I think this is fair to say, um... Uh, thank you, Focus Twitch Streams, and thank you for the gift subs. It's very nice of you. Um, uh, I would say that, like, it feels like Necromunda and that part of Games Workshop, like Forge World, probably would never have really been into the, the litigation style Games Workshop and probably are, like, very conscious that they borrow themes and ideas from popular fiction and also people could borrow stuff from their popular fiction too. Like, Ash Waste is literally Mad Max. I don't think any of it is like uh, trying to hide that it's Mad Max or trying to hide. Uh, is there a gang building site? Yes, it's called Yak Tribe is the uh, is what you want to build. Um, it's clearly a cruel wasn't it? Sure, yeah. Anyway, truly House Corridor is home to some strange sites indeed. Okay, a common sight amongst the people of House Corridor is that the physically frail and weak of mind coexisting, working together for one another, which they cannot do alone. Sometimes regarded as bearers of stigma, sometimes called stigs. Oh, so stigs means bearers of stigma amongst the gangs of House Corridor, but never mutants, lest, they speak, uh, lest the speaker wish to provoke violent reaction. 
These combinations of shambling, slack-jawed behemoth and shrewd yet wizened rider can be a great asset to any corridor gang seeking to establish dominance in the Underhive. So they're literally riding. It's the Age of Stigma. Let's go. Uh, okay. It's got four wounds, which is pretty massive. Toughness four, which is really good. And strength five, which is crazy. Cordor Stig Shambler is armed with a heavy club and a twing-linked heavy stubber. All Cordor Stig Shamblers are equipped with flak armor. And if you want, you can add a heavy flamer for 70 credits. A Cordor Stig Shambler is only available to Cordor Gangs. And it's 280 credits. That's a crazy amount of points. Like, they must be really good. Right? Like, they must be phenomenally good. I wonder how far the Arbites will be moved away from the Judge Dread clones. Uh, probably literally identical. Uh, move and shoot. This fighter may immediately re-roll any fellow leadership. Cool tests and stuff. That's some cool artwork. Stig. Oh, it literally has a sign on its neck saying Stig. That's rough. Stig is a brute. Uh, I put that in the brute section, I think. Yeah, brutes zero to two, but it's it's uh, oh it's a uh, it's a it's a brute specific one, right? Uh, sorry, it's a corridor only one. Twin heavy stubber is badass. Nice. Guess he couldn't get another job after talking. <laughs> Stick. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So that's it. Next up is the the Lutheran pattern excavation automata. Available to any gang, but at a cost of 215 credits. Okay. Let's go see if this exists. Let's get Clovis out of here. Okay, so it's got to be a hired gun, surely. So, an automata. Is it, is it the... Is it the... Uh, the Ambot. Oh, that's just an Ambot. Like a regular, regular Ambot that you buy. And can you still buy Ambots? <laughs> These model designs are so badass, I agree. Like, can you still buy Ambots? I think you buy them from Games Workshop, right? If you're buying... Uh, yeah, baby, you can so you can buy Ambots. Yep, and it's a plastic kit. Oh, fun. Okay. So why are they so cheap in... Um, Uh, Vantar, why doesn't it say where they are? Uh, two in a box, yeah, plastic kit, and it's two in a box. Okay. Uh, they're not cheap, it's a magnificent plastic kit. Okay, fun. That I mean, there are, no, there are, but in the book, in this, you could take a Lutheran Pata Excavation Automata, an Ambot, sorry, right, at 185 credits, but any gang at 215 credits. So is this like a special type of one? Um, uh, uh, like it's a uh, Just search Ambot. Could come up for it on Forge World, I think. Really? Really, really, really? Hold on. Let's see if they've got it. Ambot. Nope. Nope, not available here. But from Games Workshop. Ambot. There we go. So if I'm going to America, it's forty-seven dollars. Interesting. Uh, Games Workshop main. Then yeah, so you got it. So you got to get this. So this is a brute that's available, and this is a brute that you take in any army. Uh, okay. And Ambot is armed with tunneling claws. Uh, my Ashigan Queen is two hundred fifteen creds. So you're saying this is just pricey as fuck. Like that's what it is. It's just super good. An Ambot. Like, what's his, what's his, uh, looks cool. I think they look cool, right? And also, I guess, if you bought an Ambot, like, if you buy discount for Cordor. So, Cordor get cheaper Ambots. That's pretty fun. So, but what I mean is, is you could buy an Ambot box, buy the Ambots, and then you could run Cordor one day with an Ambot in it, and then you could run Goliath the next day with an Ambot in it. So, like, a lot of these purchases are... Like, something that you can run between different gangs, if that's what you want. My gang is five of these. Can I run all Ambot gang at your tournaments? I don't know if that's allowed. Probably not, because we've said Brutes are zero to two. Because it says it up there. 
zero to two. So no. Stop trying to break the game. Why are you trying to not have fun? It will absolutely destroy anything it touches though. It can infiltrate by drilling underground and popping up anywhere on the map. No way. No way. Bring back ambles. I agree. Uh, you don't get two ambots in a box. You can build both loadouts. Uh, you do get two ambots in a box. Um, here. Uh, ambots are fun. I mean, ambots are fun. I agree. Let's read about the ambots. Uh, the Luther Pattern Excavation Out Automata is a heavy construct build in imitation of the Amble, a huge, roughly humanoid Xenos creature common, uh, common to hot, arid worlds. Thought to have evolved in the endless deserts of Luther McIntyre the Ninth. In the Segmentum Solar, the Amble is now common across the Imperium, Ooh. as throughout the ages of mankind has attempted to domesticate the brutes and use them as a species, uh, uh, make use of the species traits. Wait, is there, is there a model for an Amble? Like an actual Amble? Have we seen artwork for an Amble? Is this the Chocobo of 40k? Is an Amble like the, the animal of 40k that we both, both know? The Blackstone Amble. Get me a link. Uh, wasn't there an Amborn Blackstone? So it exists. So we've got the Chocobo of 40k available. There's an uh, limited edition release. Oh my god, I want that so much. Amble. Amble. Oh, it's that thing! Nice. Oh my god, it's that thing. Pre-order next week. The dreaded Amble. Isn't the Zoat already in the Chocobo at 40k? I don't know what is the Chocobo at 40k. Maybe it's them cherubs. Um, uh, this is the Amble. This is it. There's an old metal one from 1987. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, anyway, this is fine. Uh, ba look, it's, again, there are baby versions of it to probably use as a bodyguard. Right? <laughs> the baby bodyguards. Uh, anyway, Ambles are natural tunnelers. Their powerful limbs end in diamond hard claws, enabling them to dig through everything up to soft rock. In addition, the, their eyes see deep into the infrared spectrum. Wow. Making impeccable use of even the faintest levels of light. They are even able to detect heat signatures as visual to stimulus. Ooh. Diamond hands. Yeah. Stonks to the moon. Um. The, the transport and trade of ambles is extremely heavily sanctioned and controlled throughout the Imperium due to how dangerous they are as hunters and how unsuitable to domestication they have proven. Uh, okay. Uh, escaping from any form of captivity and wreaking havoc upon human populations in mining colonies the galaxy over. The greatest success in domesticating the amble uh, lies in using the creatures as the organic component of heavy-duty mining construct. Oh, wait, so these are robots. Wait, have they got animals inside them? No. What? That feels like that's a mistake. You've just described them as being deadly, and then you're going to cover them in armor? See you later, Pershaw. Uh, morning, sorry I'm late. Hello, Debrot Paints. Uh, have we already re overreacted to the bottom of a tank missing? I haven't done that. Um can't have non-organic automatic in 40k remember that's true that is true that's that's fucked up when the creature awakens its new robotic shell it retains the natural tunneling instinct it had when it was flesh while its aggression and hunting impulses are suppressed by cranial governors of course when clan house gangs get their hands on one they are not thinking about its mining ability house corridor occasionally find abandoned or discarded ambots in trash heaps and sometimes even get them running again. Such metal monsters are then covered with icons of the faith or painted to appear as rusting mechanical saints doing the work of redemption. Fuck. We took your dangerous animal and we made it more dangerous, but we controlled its brain? Oh my god. How do you play this game even? Says Vault Boy in the chat. First time chatter. Hey, so we've been trying to get into Necromunda for about two months, and our answer is we don't know. The easiest answer is... Buy a box, yeah, just build it. Offer to play a thousand point pickup, get a thousand credit pickup game with your buddies. Just play the thousand point pickup game with your gangs for a while and then eventually read more about it. That's the easiest intro. The long answer is you take two weeks off, 
you read every Gunhammer article, you read everything else, you build a squad, you buy hundreds of pounds worth of terrain, then you put it on the tabletop, and then you try really hard, is the answer I think I've got. Uh, so, I would say it's probably absolutely not worth getting into. <laughs> Like based on based on the past few months, I would say like like, but also it is like. I guess the question is like, oh, like, how do you even start learning Japanese? I guess it's like, well, you can. Um, uh, and the reason I bring up Japanese is because I think it's got like a very different like syntax to like, like you know the kind of like more Latin based languages of Europe, right? That review, I think that's a good review. That's how I would review it. Uh, the greatest success in domesticating the animal lies in using creatures organic components, right? Uh, I think the best way to find is this in group to guide you in. I agree with Diadrin. Duolingo, Necromunda, Colab, Confirmed. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is it's really awesome. Like, we've just been reading the book today, right? And, like, reading through the stuff. And it's so fun. Like the very concept of it is very fun, but it's just wildly difficult to to create. Like I feel like Necromunda more than anything needs an editor. They need to like write it all out and then like they need to get that tome that they get given. They need to read it, goes back and be like, This is too big. I want this twenty five percent as big. Off you go. Like, make this smaller. This is too much. Make this smaller. Turn this into cards, make these little upgrades. Off you go. Uh, I love to play it, but I don't know any accountants. <laughs> yeah, search for book Romunda or comprehensive rulebook that community makes. Uh, I agree, and I think I agree with Diadrain. Get the starter box. Just fucking ignore everything else and just do that, right? And then get going. Um, it puts too much on an arbiter. Uh, it's a lot to expect a third person to sit and watch every game. Why would you need an arbiter? Question mark says idiot wind in the chat. Um, sounds like you're saying Ghost Rider needs more managers. No, I said an editor, right? I was very specific and said editor manager d would be like, have you edited today? Yes. Have you written stuff today? Yes. Congratulations. Um, uh, oh yeah, buy the models and play the gang war supplement for Grimdark Firefight. There's also that also is an option. Okay, so the Ambot's really tough. Okay, so you can take an Ambot, and an Ambot is available for any gang, but is also ch a cheap. Um, if I put uh, it in here, uh, Steve, no Ambot. Uh, you can have zero to two Ambots, Ambots, uh, and cheaper in Cordor is what you can do. But they're also available to any gang. Which is pretty rad. And I like that they're cheaper to Cordor because they literally find, like, trash. Which is pretty funny. Uh, what about uh, manager for the editor? Big brain. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. The Jotun H-grade Servitor Ogryn. Oh, boy. Now, again, you can buy these from Games Workshop. There they are. The Ogryns. There we go. Oh, grids. Oh, grids. Um, uh, they're supposed to balance games quite actively, keeping campaigns running along. So like a DM in D&D. &D. Again, Idiot Wind, I'm with you. Like, why? Like, I think I'm utterly against the campaign version of Necromunda now. Like, I'm just like, let's, let, let's, let's make it so that we can pick up, do pick up version of Necromunda. The miniatures are cool, the narrative's cool, the setting's cool. Like, you could absolutely do campaign and be a mega weirdo and get, like, crazy into it, which I respect a lot. Uh, and some people love that. That's their life. They're like, they're like, that's my hobby. That's my enjoyment. I like doing that. And I'm like, go off, king, queen, person, MB, whatever. Just go off. Be yourself. Go for it. But I'm like, I want to build... 800 credits worth of idiots. I want to add these other two idiots that I think are cool. Next game, I want to do other 800 idiots. Some more dudes. That seems fun to me. Um, they also slap me max players. No, the campaign for is the big draw for me at least. Okay. Um, uh, you can make an amazing skirmish game in the models and setting. Yes. That's, that's my point. Um, 
From what I understand, you can't just play it for free like D&D, right? You need minis since it actually represents something. Oh, a Vault Boy, uh, are you the f are you a first time no idea about miniatures? Yes, to play Necromunda, you need miniatures to play the game. I mean, you could, if you wanted to, print out some pictures of the miniatures and use slap them on little bases. But it's a physical game. Uh, there's like There are digital versions of the game. Uh, there's like Necromunda Hired Gun, uh, and then there's another Necromunda game, which are available on PC. You can just play those. So that's a thing uh, that people do. Um, but like me and most of the chat, and I also play computer games as well, um, but I... I like the miniatures game, and what's great about playing miniatures game, if you've never played miniatures games, is you get to go out and meet loads of people who you wouldn't normally meet, if that makes sense. Like, you go to a local gaming club, and you make friends, or you go to an event, and you make friends, and for me, that's one of the greatest things about miniature wargaming, is the in-person creativity. You build stuff, you buy stuff, you paint stuff. And then you go and then you show that to people and you see other people's stuff. You're like, oh, dude, that's so cool. Or like, I can't believe you built that. That's wicked. And then you make a new friend. And that's fun. Um, but Necroman is not the vehicle for that. Um, so, yeah. Like, I hope that helps. Uh, see you later, Aspron. Take care of yourself. Um, Rob, would you like me? Uh, yes, I would. <laughs> At the rogue, that is correct. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, so listen, we're just going to do the Jotuns, and then we are we'll be done. We'll be done for today. We'll come back to this part two next week. Um, we'll come back to this next week. Okay. So the Jotuns, Homo sapien gigantus, commonly known as Ogrins, are one of the most frequently seen strains of abhuman within the Imperium. Their origin is believed to be a chain of high gravity prison worlds populated by mankind many millennia ago and lost during the Age of Strife. In isolation from terror, humans stranded upon these worlds bred and adapted to their hostile environments, becoming progressively more large and hardy with each passing generation. Unfortunately, intelligence, probably not that prominent uh, trait amongst denizens of these prison worlds to begin with, deteriorated over the generations, so that by the time the Ogryn had become a distinct and stable subspecies of humanity, it was hopelessly dull and and unintelligent. Have you come across Ratskin yet? No, we haven't done him yet. Um, they're Mancunians. Wow. <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot of tweaks to play competitively. Like uh, by competitively, I mean a tournament. Like you could you could very conscious you could very consciously put a tournament on and be like, look, like if you big brain the thing for like the most broken list or whatever, then fine. Yeah, like you could definitely you don't like need. To like be like you're the best like n competitive necrobunda player of this only one event that's ever happened, but you can put a tournament on, and people can play games and have a good time. I think that's very relevant, and it makes more sense because it's how most of the other game systems play, and it's something you could do for that setting. Uh, whereas balance and balance around campaign play, some gangs start strong and fall off, and some get better over the course of the campaign. That's also true. That's also fine there for me. Like, I. Like you're not trying to, like, be like this is the tournament game that's available to everyone, right? It's just meant to be. This is a fun set of minis to build, paint, and play games with, and then go organize some games with your friends. I think one of the biggest problems for Necromunda is that it's a campaign game because those things are so rare to get off the ground. Like mainly because of the work. Like I, I again, I don't know much about D and D because I haven't done loads of D&D &D. but whenever people talk to me about it they're like yeah we were going to do a campaign that fell apart or we we're going to do a campaign then uh, someone fell out we we're going to do like I don't know why there aren't I'm sure there must be in big cities there has to be professional D&D &D DMs right that already has to be a business that people have like there has to be someone in like I don't know New York or like one of those big cities where there's lots of like rich like people with exposable income who want to play Dungeons and Dragons. Like you just have the guy be a DM or the lady be the DM. You know what I mean? There has to be someone who like DM stuff. Um, could this ever be an entry point for someone who wasn't already a Warhammer pervert? Absolutely not. Could this be an entrance to someone? I really don't think it could be. Um, anyway. Uh, the humans turned upon these worlds, bred and adapted their hostile environments. Unfortunately, intelligence probably not that prominent a trait amongst the denizens of these prison worlds to begin with. Uh, so that by the time the Ogryn had become a distinct and stable subspecies of humanity, it was hopelessly dull and unintelligent. Wow. Ogryns are incredibly strong, durable, and remarkably loyal. 
traits which make up for their lack of intellect and their usefulness to the Imperium. They are slow to learn, but once a lesson has been learned, it stays on their simple minds forever. This is just rude. Uh, an Ogryn dedicated to the redemption might have only holy re relics hung around their body or tattoos to explain their devotion. Uh, but Ogryns, like, are also going to be really popular because they're in Dark Tide, right? Like, they're going to be super popular because everyone likes Dark Tide. Like, they love Dark Tide. So there you go. Right. And now we're into Hired Guns. Perfect. We'll we'll stop. We'll stop just before Hired Guns and we'll come back to Hired Guns next time. And we'll add Hired Guns on. Um, I feel attacked by the color text. <laughs> Me too, buddy. Me too. Available to any gang. The Jotun Heavy Grade. Uh, so let me just add this on. Generic to any gang. Zero to two. Uh, zero to two as well for the Jotuns. Zero to two. Uh, so, uh, that will leave it here for this week, and then we'll come back to next week. We could have probably done a whole book in a week, but obviously, like we spent the first hour just not not being sure how to do this. So, thanks to Diadrin for pointing out that we should just go through each book in in person, because eventually we're going to be able to skip stuff. Like if the Jotuns are in every book, yeah, like the Ogrins, we could just skip them every time. So we might be able to like fly through this. It was quite fun. I think my favorite at the moment was Clovis the Redeemer. And Deacon Malakev, that kind of was a bit of a weird uh, take. I, like, I wasn't sure about the Stig Shambler. I thought I'd quite like the narrative for the Stig Shambler, but I wasn't into it. Um, tomorrow's show, we're just going to be doing some painting. Uh, so it's going to be painting day. Uh, but also that means just chatting about anything that might come up and that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, like those are things that are available. Uh, Warmaster Coder, just search for Dungeon Master on Fiverr. There are tons. Six sessions for $400. There you go, professional. Um, like, that's what I mean. I think that there's like room for this stuff to be available. Uh, I imagine most of this stuff will be in the other house books with their own gang themed lore tidbits. I agree, Honke. Um, that'd be really fun as well. So I'm looking forward to going through all the books actually one in one. So that's a really good, I think that's a good step for all of us is to do that. Um, especially because we've now got this, we've now got this guide on what we're going to do, right? We're going forward. And we've got this goal where we're going to do a big event here at the arena and people can come along if obviously you're UK based and we're going to do our like our tournament Necromunda which are, or our pickup game Necromunda uh, event uh, and then people can come because it's like it's also super low ball. So like right now, if you're like excited about maybe um, going to like be a part of that over the next, I don't know, let's say it's in six months time. So let's say it's whenever six months is. That's the idea. So pick up a necromunda gang or 3d print it or get some proxies or whatever i don't give a shit right and then get some hangers on or hide guns build it paint it get ready right for playing that that's the goal now that's our focus as on the tuesday show that's what we're going to do uh so let's do it it's gonna be fun 